the the Christian Trinity is similar to the Hindu Trimurti, where three gods are united in one Godhead. However, uh, while Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are all individuals with their own lives and even wives, yet working together as a unified committee like a district court with three judges, Christians, specifically Trinitarian Christians, believe that their Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are all the same person in three different forms. As if God is playing a video game and Jesus is his character. God made flesh so that a spiritual being can play in a physical world, just like we'll be in a physical world playing a digital character in a computerized world. However different that character may be from the player, they are still effectively the same person, meaning that the character is whoever the player is and would consequently know everything the player does. This idea of Jesus being the physical manifestation of the Spirit of God is not well supported in the Bible, which never mentions the Trinity, and there are a number of verses in both the Old and New Testaments which contradict that idea. And for that reason, Sir Isaac Newton, who was a very religious Christian, insisted that the Bible shows that God and Jesus are two distinct characters with different minds knowing different things. So not all Christians are Trinitarian. Some are Binitarian or Unitarian. For example, American presidents John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Millard Fillmore, and William Howard Taft are all Unitarian Christians, believing that there's one God known as El, Allah, Abba, or Yehovah, and that everyone else, including Jesus, is not God. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon religion, is a Christian denomination. I know because I was raised by them, and they definitely consider themselves Christian. Uh, their prophet said that he saw Jesus and Jehovah standing next to each other. So Mormons are a binitarian denomination, one of a few of, uh, in which the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are each different from and not equal to each other. Mormons and Muslims both believe that Jesus was a prophet of God with miraculous powers, like many other prophets reportedly had, and that Jesus was special, being conceived within his human mother by the very Spirit of God himself. But they believe that, that Jesus was his own separate person and not a physical avatar of the Father God. Studies of the history of comparative world religions imply that Islam grew out of early, an early version of Unitarian Christianity called Arianism, because the Arians clashed with the Trinitarians at the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century, and the Arians were then banished to the city of Medina, where a good portion of Islam emerged some three centuries later. Likewise, a few centuries earlier, Christianity as a whole had already uh, grown out of rabbinic Judaism, albeit with some other mostly Greek influences. And Judaism, um, in turn, appears to have emerged another few centuries earlier than that from a blend of Persian and Mesopotamian mythos. Religion and languages both change over time in slightly different ways. The way languages evolve is analogous to the way animals evolve through cladogenesis, where one species becomes two distinct yet similar ones by each building up their own library of local accents, idioms, slang terms, and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me until they become notably different dialects. And then they grow so far apart that ultimately they're no longer mutually intelligible. And then the process continues as those two become four and then eight and so on, except for the ones like Latin, for example, that go extinct. Although that's not always consistent. I once saw a two-way conversation where one guy was speaking Spanish and the other guy was speaking Italian. And those languages are closely related well enough that they, they understood each other at least well enough to perform a business transaction. Languages sometimes borrow cognates from each other. English, for example, is a blend of Anglo-Saxon and Germanic and has adopted bits and pieces from other languages too. French, Russian, Arabic, and Spanish words are often found in modern English sentences. Religions do the same thing, evolving by hybridization or horizontal gene transfer, borrowing or trading tropes, rejecting this, adopting that, and incorporating this other thing too so that any one religion might have multiple roots. The Quran has many of the same stories that are in the Bible, but they're often different, sometimes in important ways. And the way that Jews and Christians interpret the Hebrew Bible is very different. And thus, modern religions tend to worship different versions of the same God, where older religions worship entirely different gods. Hinduism, for example, is the oldest religion in continuous practice. Even the more recent books in their library of scriptures are older than the Bible. But the oldest religions 
didn't necessarily depend on any gods at all, being based more on spirituality than on theology. Druidism, shamanism, Taoism, and animism are not based on deities so much as on spirits. Once upon a time, and for a very long time, before there was any formal theology, it seems that animism was the earliest, the most primitive, and the most enduring religion of, in many versions. It's a belief in which every person has a soul, but so does every other animal and every plant. Sometimes they even believe that rocks and mountains had spirits and that activities and events could have spirits too. This is where we get our first gods, the god of spring or of the harvest, the god of war, the god of beer making, the god of basket weaving, all began as the spirit of spring and the spirit of war and so on. The spirits of the river and of the sea became the god of the river and the god of the sea. Then they had sex, because that's what happens as soon as gods get human form. They either cleave into women or wrestle men, because these stories are told by people. As these earliest religions evolved into maturity, the gods became one completely anthropomorphized category and spirits became another. While gods technically are spirits capable of taking human form now and again and, and killing the body would not kill the god, living things were considered to be physical bodies that only came to life if they were infused with a life force. This is essentially what George Stahl proposed in 1708 in his medical theory of animism, the foundation of vitalism, wherein life and disease were explained by an animating spirit inhabiting every part of the body, in which case it wouldn't be just people who had the spiritual component, but everything alive, including animals, plants, fungus, even bacteria. In other words, if you have a soul, then so does a tree and so does an amoeba. Uh, if you have a soul, then your dog clearly does too. It's like when Obi-Wan Kenobi said, the force is an energy field created by all living things. As if life is the spiritual biosphere enveloping and animating bits of the material world. As such was my belief at the time, at one time, because uh, I was conditioned by new age hippie culture and fooled by deceptive media, which talked about ectoplasm and parapsychology as if either of those things were real. What George Stahl proposed centuries ago was that life was made alive by a vaporous fluid and that when any living thing died, this vital fluid would evaporate out of it. Now, in most belief systems, the spiritual aspect of any organism would pertain to the, the essence of whatever it was as a residual self-image. However, I, I remember that when I used to believe in the spiritual life force, I, I thought that once anything died, that this essence would evaporate back into a sort of spiritual hydrosphere. Like, if this cup represents me, and I, and I pour it out into the well of souls, and I, I could immediately dip my cup back in, and I might get some of me back into the cup, but not all of me. And what I get might be mixed with uh, some of somebody else's spirit, and maybe other spirits too, like, you know, from moss and mosquitoes, protists, and so on. That's how I thought reincarnation worked, that it was always a new mixture for a new life, and that's why we can't clearly remember our past lives, because we are no longer that exact agent, entity, or organism anymore. George Stahl also proposed that new life forms could be spontaneously generated by this vital force as it ebbed out of once living matter. That is, old vegetables, dead bodies, and even poop decayed. The vital vapor ebbing out of them could also decay, spawning new and albeit repulsive life in the form of mice, mold, or, 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 or maggots, or fungus. You see, contrary to what the dictionary says, spontaneous generation was always a supernatural belief in spiritual vitalism and was never even remotely similar to the scientific concept of abiogenesis. I've written to a few dictionaries who conflate these two, asking them to correct their continued confusion, but I never get a reply. Of course, it turns out that this notion of living energy, the theory of vitalism, was disproved in 1828. There is no life force animating our bodies, and our current understanding of biology in the 21st century shows that there was never a need for such a thing. But before anyone had any idea of the obscene complexity of biochemistry at the molecular level with the function of synapses and ATP molecules and calories and all of that, before we knew that oxygen was a thing and why we need it, People, simple people, thought that 
living things must be spiritually animated, as if bodies could be created out of clay or any other material, and, and whatever it was would come alive once a spiritual soul was put into it somehow. I like to imagine that some of our primitive ancestors figured out how to sculpt renderings of animals out of clay, and then after they threw a few hemp plants onto the fire pit, they sat around the fire holding their clay figures and said, wouldn't it be awesome if we could bring this to life? And then as the smoke began to take effect, someone else suggested that maybe some of the gods knew how to bring sculptures to life. And then someone else said, maybe they already have. Then a moment later, somebody else says, maybe that's where all the animals we see came from. Maybe that's where we came from. And they liked that idea so much that they would not hear any criticism from skeptics saying, yeah, well, that's just like your opinion, man. And some of the people in power back then liked that story so much that, that it wasn't long before you dare not question that assumption because the tribal leader had already declared that blasphemy, heresy, and apostasy were now capital crimes worthy of the death penalty. If the law is that infidels can be killed on, on the word of one or two witnesses, then just as a matter of population mechanics, it won't be very long before there won't be any outspoken skeptics anymore because everyone had better be a believer. And that's how religion spread far and wide. And consequently, modern people have inherited thousands of years of irrational thinking and we haven't gotten any better. In fact, our brain size has actually gotten smaller. It doesn't matter that we've accumulated so much knowledge because so few people want to tap into it to see what the truth is. Many would rather just make believe something else instead. Especially when your magic imaginary friend is the most powerful being imaginable who can do anything, fix any problem if he wants to, and that you yourself have the power of positive thought, that you can change reality through faith, that if you could just believe hard enough as a conscious act of will, of mind over matter, then you could tell that mountain to jump into the sea, and it would be in the sea. That is the promise of the power of pretend. It's not what you imagine your God can do. It's what faith lets you imagine that you can do. So you claim to know things that no one even can know, as if you can heal diseases, even if you don't know, even if you don't understand what the cause is, and you think it's demons or humors or, or vapors or misaligned chakras. You can pretend that you can continue to live on forever and ever because you're a prized creation of a loving God who designed you for a very special purpose, even if that purpose is to suffer and struggle all your life, maybe for someone else's benefit, maybe for no apparent reason at all. The Lord works in delirious ways. And you can justify that by saying that your personal God has your back some other way, maybe. There's always an excuse. At least when you die and, and as your consciousness fades off and shuts off entirely, you won't have the opportunity to be disappointed. Now, while none of that fantasy has any appeal to me whatsoever, I understand that lots of other people really like believing in things that are not evidently true or even possible for no more reason than because it makes them feel good somehow, like, like, like a high from a drug. And it gives them an excuse for everything that they don't understand. For example, very few people have an adequate understanding of how the brain works or what the mind is. A spiritual believers argue for an immaterial mind, a, a literal ghost in the machine, pushing buttons and pulling levers, driving our bodies around like vehicles, as if they, they could get out of this body when it breaks down and they could occupy and operate some other body, trading in you know, the, the old one for a newer model, or they could become pedestrians for a while, except that they'd be the kind that you can't see or test for in any way. You, ju you just got to believe that they're there. Spiritualists can't understand consciousness either, and they insist that not even neuroscientists understand the philosophy of mind, that, that the experts are mistaken in thinking that the mind is basically chemical. Instead, believers insist that the consciousness comes only from the soul, which they say is separate from the body, that we exist in two forms, mind-body dualism. Daniel Dennett 
is a world-renowned cognitive scientist specializing in the philosophy of mind. And I had the opportunity to ask him about whether he thinks the mind is purely physical. He told me that as far as scientists are concerned, neuroscientists, psychologists, cognitive scientists, there is almost no, capital letters, no support for mind-body dualism. He said that uh, Philip Goff, a philosopher, has made a brave foray into panpsychism, but it's ridiculed in most quarters. So there is no evident distinction between the mind and the physical body that makes up the mind. I've heard a number of religious believers trying to say that Daniel Dennett didn't believe in his own existence, that, that, that Dennett said that uh, his that the mind doesn't come from the brain, as if the mind is some mysterious otherworldly phenomenon. But that's not what Dennett said. He said that the mind doesn't come from any one part of the brain, that it is an emergent property of the entire brain collectively, along with the supportive biochemical matrix, of course. And I define the mind as a collection of mental aspects that give us the impression of our ever-changing state of being the collective elements that make up our dynamic personalities, including our specific knowledge and continuous thoughts, perception, attitudes, aptitudes, propensities, proclivities, and so on, as well as our memories and personal histories, our various types of desires, along with integrated fears and neuroses, everything we think and feel and how we do all of that, which makes us who we are, not as a static identity, but minute by minute as all these things all these things make up our impression of mind, keep adjusting to the current conditions. I think most lay people would agree with this general description, but there is some disagreement among scholars as to what the mind is, or even if there is such a thing at all. Neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland says there is no mind, there is only the brain, and that the mind is an illusion. If so, then only the illusion is immaterial, as each of these elements of what most of us would call the mind are individually definitely physical, meaning material. Churchland and Dennett both describe consciousness as the ebb and flow of neurons inside a healthy human brain, meaning that what we call the mind really does emanate from and is generated mostly by the brain. And I would add that other aspects of body chemistry contribute to that too. And I say this because the most basic element of the mind is consciousness defined as an awareness of self and or perception of surroundings. You don't have to have human intelligence to have consciousness. There are numerous studies showing that other animals and especially mammals have consciousness as well as emotions very similar to our own with, with much the same neural connectivity too. But even primitive animals with little or no brain are obviously able to perceive and react to the challenges of their environment without any neurons or, or, or sensory organs. There are even unicellular organisms with no brain at all, where there's one unicellular organism that demonstrates a capacity for memory and reason in laboratory tests. It's just that having more sensory systems, especially with a multicellular organism with an advanced neural network of tens of billions of interconnected neurons to better coordinate all these collective senses gives one a greater awareness and a higher level of consciousness. Believers insist that we are not just a bag of chemicals, as they put it, but, but regardless whether we are more than that, it is a fact that we are at least that. Uh, Nobel laureate Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the DNA double helix, wrote the astonishing hypothesis that you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. That sentiment really resonated with me. There is a beauty in stripping away our vanity to realize that we are actually far more complex than we ever imagined and that all the patterns and tendencies we exhibit personally and collectively are emergent, being unwittingly detected by our most basic components, whether we look at individuals in a population, cells in a body, molecules in a cell, or whatever. But one of the arguments that believers like is that since the brain is made of atoms and atoms are not conscious themselves, then how could a collection of unconscious atoms become conscious? It's not just that these people don't understand the principle of emergence. It's like when creationists say that they accept only microevolution without understanding what it is, but that they don't accept macroevolution. Idealists 
except only soft or weak emergence, but not what they call hard or strong emergence, which is the formation of the mind from collection, uh, collective functions of the brain. And rather than cite a neuroscientist to support this, some believers have instead cited professor of theoretical physics, Matthew Fisher, who says that neuroscientists have basically no idea how psychiatric pharmaceuticals work because he says that no one understands the biochemical mechanisms underlying awareness. The fact remains that we do know exactly how certain drugs block particular receptors and, and in the brain and what chemical reactions are taking place. Rather than attempt to explore the incomprehensible complexity of the haphazard configuration that we all are, which is quite different from the efficient simplicity that we should expect of divine designs, of a, especially from a magical creator who is also an infallible super genius, spiritualists imagine that the ghost inside us does all the actual thinking as if the brain isn't really capable of any of what it does. And if that was true, then every neuroscientist would believe in supernatural souls, right? So why are many of them, if not the majority of them, materialistic atheists? I reached out to a few neuroscientists at my school. Uh, Rick Gerken, uh, professor of life sciences, wrote back saying that he believes that the mind is a product of the brain, the body, the physical environment, and only those things. But he didn't give me the evidence behind that. Another neuroscientist, uh, Steve Helms Tillery, studies how the brain learns to use sensory information in the controlled skilled motor tasks, or in the control of skilled motor tasks, to operate not only the physical body, but also prosthetic devices. He sent me his own PDF presentation on how the mind is purely material, along with some explanation of brain functions that I thought were too technical to present here. So he wrote me a simplified version of how the brain builds physical connections when rehearsing pretty much anything, which is why you're good at things you practice and may forget a lot what you haven't had to recall in a while. He says, we know all the circuits involved in all these activities, episodic memories and so on. And Tillery went on to explain rest networks, including the default mode network, accounting or amounting to a, a set of neural structures which appear to have coordinated activity when you are thinking and engaged in a specific task. These diffuse structures have only a measure, have a measure of synchrony in their oscillations and activity in them appears more reliably when people are engaged in autobiographical thought. And some even call them the basis of ego. He says disruption of this default mode is a key element in, in psychedelic intoxication and may be involved in such disparate mental phenomenon as the dissolution of ego and synthesis, both of which are common when tripping. He added that these networks appear to be functional connectivities between neural areas which serve common functions. Thinking is connected with activation of particular of these circuits depending on the nature of the thoughts. And I heard back from another neuroscientist, Dr. Corian Rogalski, Director of Communication Neuroimaging and Neuroscience Lab at Arizona State University. Her research interests include the neurobiology of language and music perception, and how these processes inter, uh, interact with attention and memory in the motor system. The aim of her work is to better understand the neural and cognitive resources that are needed to improve communication and quality of life for individuals who have experienced language and cognitive impairments after a brain injury, such as a stroke which is definitely a physical effect to the mind, meaning that the mind cannot be supernatural. And she has two points to back that up, and I quote. Uh, one, centuries of evidence that damage to the brain can completely change the morals, beliefs, and personality traits of a person. Phineas Gage may be the most famous example, but there are numerous other examples of this, one of them being a prominent finding in neurology that tumors that grow in particular parts of the brain can lead to drastic changes such as towards pedophilia, violence, or, or either to devout religiousness or a complete loss of faith. Then if the tumor is removed, these drastic changes are completely gone or at least drastically reduced. Sometimes this happens almost immediately or may take a few months as the brain recovers. The same sorts of things can happen due to a stroke, brain injury, due to a car accident, bacterial infections to the brain, etc. Two, she explained the basic premise of Antonio Damasio's somatic marker idea that has been supported by numerous peer-reviewed studies, that most people assume that our mind thinks up an emotion, and then because our mind is dealing with this emotion, we have a 
physiological response. For example, I see a police car about to pull me over. My mind says I should be anxious, and therefore, because I label this as an anxious situation, my heart rate will increase, I will begin to sweat, etc. But this is actually not the case at all. Instead, stimuli based on associations from previous experience with them, police lights, an angry person, our dog happily coming towards us, whatever, induces unconscious brain signals to induce a physiological response with increased heart rate, etc. Then our conscious mind sometimes, because of these physiological changes in previous experience with that situation, attaches a label to it of anxiousness, fear, happiness, whatever. Demacio's hypothesis goes on to say that our decisions of what to do in these situations are not dependent on our mind's thoughts about what's going on, but rather that unconscious physiological response. It doesn't matter if our mind knows what's going on. If that unconscious physiological response happens, our behavior is affected. So your body's response to a situation, not your mind, dictates how you will behave. And she added that it's true that the brain is the last frontier for medicine and science, and there is a lot we still do not know about the brain and human cognition. However, we are exponentially learning more and more as computers have become exponentially faster and more powerful so that we can begin to simulate various networks of neurons. Prior to computers, we couldn't even begin to model how the brain thinks because of its complexity. But now that we're getting better and better at it, there's still a lot left to be on, you know, that is an unknown, there is medical advances at work. Before germs were discovered, people thought that diseases were brought about by, through hexes and evil spirits. She went on to say that a very convincing line of research is related to neural implants that can move robotic arms, which help people that have been paralyzed due to a spinal cord injury. Small computers implanted in the spinal cord or brain transduce neural signals into a computer code that then controls the movements of the person's, the person's hand. Thus, scientists have quite reliably translated the firing sequences of millions of neurons into a format which a computer can then make an arm do the exact thing the neurons were thinking of. There are many more neurons in the brain, 85 billion or so, so we have a long way to go, but this is major progress in that direction. Another convincing line of research that she mentioned is cochlear implants. The cochlea is technically part of the brain situated deep inside the ear. It contains neurons that essentially transduce sound waves into neural firing. The neurons firing send the message to the rest of the brain, thereby allowing us to be aware of a sound. Until recently, damage to neurons in the cochlea due to genetic injury, uh, mutation or injury meant that the person was deaf. But now, there are many amazing and heartwarming videos on, on YouTube of children hearing their mom for the first time because scientists and engineers have been able to design a computer, aka a cochlear implant, that can be implanted in a person's ear that can do the same things the neurons would have done had they been healthy. So again, we can design and build computers that work as neurons doing very complex things. She closed the message by saying that we have to acknowledge that if the mind can be altered, enhanced, and controlled by chemicals changing our mood and mental clarity and even your personality chemically, that kind of proves that the mind really is chemical and physically material, no matter how much the mystics want to pretend that it's magical, immortal spirit or some other imaginary nonsense. Those are her words, not mine. And we often hear that concepts are not material because they're not made of anything, but in fact, they are material because concepts originate as thoughts that exist in synapses. And some of the proof of that is that we now have the technology to reconstruct imagined letters from the visual cortex. Beyond that, there are devices that can now effectively read your mind to duplicate not just letters, but images to print out what is in your head. So concepts, thoughts, memories, everything that the mind is are all material. They're all made of and stored in material energy. They have effects on and can be affected by other physical materials. A well-known ethologist named Franz de Waal has become convinced that when we, when we look at the behavior of highly social animals, you can see very clearly that there are things like feeling bad, that you did a dreadful thing. Animals feel a kind of guilt when they do something inappropriate. There is no doubt that when a dog does something that it knows it really shouldn't do and it gets caught, then it does what we do. Its head goes down, it hunches over, tail between its legs, and, and it, it skulks off. Now, that behavior persists as it tries to reconcile or ask forgiveness. DeWall believes that there are no unique human emotions. We share these emotions because 
They're part of the subcortal structures with all mammals. Our media likes to tell us that we're only using 10% of our brains when in fact we use the full 100%. The basal portions regulate glands and bodily functions, process sensory input, enable motor control, and so on. But the number of neurons we have in the cerebral cortex or gray matter is that 10% of our brains that do the higher order thinking whence our wisdom, intelligence, and personalities emerge. This is what most people envision as their soul with some enlightened spiritualists uh, the, the associating the soul with consciousness as if the brain can't think or know anything without a soul inside it. So the topic always comes up that what happens when you're not conscious? I've actually heard spiritual leaders argue that when you're asleep and dreaming, your mind travels to a metaphysical plane that they believe in dreams, or they believe that dreams are real and that reality is a dream. But what if you're not asleep? What happens when the brain gets shut down and seems dead but doesn't actually die and is somehow resuscitated later? This is when a small percentage of people suffering cardiac arrest may report a near-death experience, which in the United States tends to be described as a periodic or inexplicable perception where there is no detectable brain activity, yet the, parent, the, the patient still has at least the ability to hear and remember what was said later. How does memory function when there is no brain activity due to a lack of oxygen? I know uh, uh, that leukemia patients in an oxygen deprived state uh, shift into an unconscious phase where the body tries to minimize all costly functions in an attempt to preserve the brain for as long as possible. If this goes on too long leading to brain damage, then how did your, your, your supernatural immortal soul lose the ability to think properly? If we are just spiritual passengers in these physical vehicles, then it wouldn't be possible to change our personalities, propensities or proclivities with chemicals or drugs or, or physical damage to the brain. Spiritual beings are separate from and entirely independent of physical chemical effects. Yet, we know that drugs and surgery and other physical trauma can and definitely do affect who we are and how we think and feel, which all by itself should be evidence that there is no soul. And while we yet don't know how this happens, I suspect that when the brain is extremely stressed, the, the mind, which produces the brain, goes into something like a computer safe mode because biochemical systems like breathing and so on that are controlled by the brain still function even when the brain isn't showing any activity. During such times, a few of those who report near-death experiences also report heightened perceptions that are impossible for physical senses like out-of-body experience. And the reason I got into transcendental meditation when I was a young man was because I was fascinated by out-of-body experiences, which I took to be firsthand observation of the spiritual world I had reportedly, I had repeatedly achieved the unmistakable vibrations of the initial stage of that, but I was never able to transcend my, the flesh to, to see outside my own body uh, or to see my body from the outside. I, worse than that, I interviewed other people professing to have these experiences under various conditions, and I found that there was no consistency between their accounts, like there certainly would be if it were really real. I found the same problem even in peer-reviewed studies. For example, Jeffrey Long is a medical doctor promoting the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. He published a paper to establish their reality by listing similarities like the contrast of bright light with tunnel vision and the sensation of having found your happy place, which is not surprising during periods of extreme stress, especially you know, facing an existential, existential threat. But the paper also endorses dubious claims made by anecdotal accounts of the patients, and it ignores important disparities that call for the associated assumptions, or that call the associated assumptions into question, with some patients having terrifying experiences too. Some patients report seeing the spirit of their dead father or something like that, but how would you recognize him if he didn't have his body? Why would a spiritual form look exactly like the body he used to operate? None of us look like our cars. Was your father's spirit naked? No, of course not. In the spirit world, everyone has ghost clothes. A number of studies have shown that the description of near-death experiences differs significantly depends on, depending on the person's religious perspective. 
One illustrative experiment involved the God helmet. Significant stress on the brain can be safely duplicated without being near death, such as being flung in a centrifuge for astronaut training. The so-called God helmet is a device that electronically stimulates the brain in subtle ways. The most common reaction people have is the idea that another unspecified but intelligent, uh, intelligent presence was in the room with them. And some thought it was a ghost uh, and some thought it was a God. At least one person thought that the other, per the other presence was himself having an out of body experience. Susan Blackmore, who claims to have been out of body herself in the past, says that the God helmet was a similar sensation and one of the most extraordinary experiences she'd ever had. She also remarked about how easy it would be to deceive someone with a device like this. And then this caused her to, to reflect back on her own prior studies on out-of-body experiences, causing her to question the reality that she once endorsed about out-of-body experiences. Uh, then the uh, famous atheist Richard Dawkins also tried the God helmet and, and remarked that he only felt slightly dizzy and quite strange, but otherwise pleasantly relaxed. So he didn't have a religious experience at all. It wasn't ingrained into him to have one. This is consistently what happens as anecdotal religious claims are put to the test. They're found to be subjective, implausible, and not likely genuine experiences of anything supernatural. For another example, near-death experiences reported by Hindus don't match what is typically reported by those raised in Abrahamic faiths. And more importantly, Hindus report meeting their gods and so on during these experiences. You should read their accounts. They're quite different. I saved a video where a Swami claimed that his consciousness ascended out of his body to meet his God. He was even able to say how small the soul is, its physical size, and in what chakra the SIM card of the body is in. A visiting journalist asked the Swami why it is that in, in a near-death experience, Christians see Jesus, Buddhists see Buddha, and people of other religious faiths see whatever they expect to see. Because Hindus don't see Jesus and Christians don't see Krishna. There was never a revelation of spirituality that the subject did not already know about and believe in, which indicates that mystic visions and near-death experiences are illusions that only accentuate preconceived notions. The Swami answered that people experience whatever they believe, but that's just one God taking many forms. So that ultimately, there is no truth to the idea that one must accept Jesus to be saved, nor is there a hell to be saved from. That's just what you were conditioned to believe in Christian culture. He is able to make that judgment about y'all, about Christians, but he's unable to recognize that he's only reciting what he was conditioned to believe himself, because Hindus see near-death experiences as proof of reincarnation from past lives. In a 2010 study attempting a psychological approach of out-of-body experiences and uh, hallucinatory, hallucinatory experiences, psychologist Alejandro Parra noted that undergraduate students reporting out-of-body experiences showed a higher level of cognitive perceptual schizotypy, absorption, uh, disassociation fantasy, and hallucination, uh, hallucination proneness and visual imagery than did non-OBEers, out-of-body experience people. He said this was in support of previous studies, and I should mention that Alejandro Parra is both a parapsychologist and a psychotherapist. A bit of a contradiction in terms, but you know, it, it, there is obviously an overlap in the patients there. There's a lot more I could say about studies of past life experiences, but the most important thing is this. In a collective study of the neurological origin of outer body experiences, neurologist Olaf Blanke, Theodore Lundis, Lawrence Spinelli, and Margita Seek noted that despite great public interest and many case studies, systematic neurological studies are, of out-of-body experiences are extremely rare and to date, no testable scientific theory exists. That study goes on to describe how these near-death experiences or you know, out-of-body experiences, it, it describes them in terms of pathology, dysfunction, disorder, and mental imagery. So after 50 years, believe, all believers have is a handful of unexplained anomalies that might literally be nothing more than lucky guesses or vivid dreams after the fact. In the entire history of bewildering inanity claimed by spiritualists of every sort in any religion, none of them 
have ever shown even the slightest substance for their phantasms. No reason to believe there was ever even a there there. Instead, what we typically always only ever see are either the empty assertions of impossible nonsense or we find frauds like that toddler who got rich and famous uh, selling 10 million books claiming to have been to heaven in a near-death experience only to admit later that he lied being coached by his parents. He's not the only example of these type hoaxes. Religion is rife with them and based on them. Everyone wants to believe Yoda when he said, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. But Yoda was a Muppet. We, we are not in any sense separable from our physical forms. Everything that makes us who we are is what we are. We know we have these bodies and we don't know that we have a soul, nor could we have. Astrophysicist Sean Carroll and I argued a bit about when science can say that something is possible or impossible. I gave him several absurd examples and all he would say was that it's highly improbable. Only when it came to the soul did Carol finally say that we know for certain that doesn't and can't happen. He supports that with a rather impressive physics equation and an explanation of quantum field theory. In summary, he says that either some ill-defined metaphysical substance not subject to known laws of physics interacts with atoms in our brains in ways that thus far have eluded every controlled experiment in the history of science or people hallucinate when they're nearly dead. And what he's saying there is that there is no possible way to remove your mind from your body because your body is the source of your mind. There is no theoretical or metaphysical model for how yourself, whatever that would be, could in any sense be you, not yet not be both in and of your body, not just somebody, your body. He also said that the existence of the supernatural soul would not only defy physics, but if souls existed, it would actually prove physics entirely wrong but we know physics is not wrong. And we know that every supernatural belief ever proposed can be wrong and apparently is wrong. All any religious believer can do is present largely irrelevant or fallacious philosophical arguments, pose a few curious conundrums, and, and maybe quote a few scientists out of context, but they cannot justify the unsupported assertion that there was ever anything supernatural in the sense that the mystics describe. Your life experiences have built a network of synaptic connections in your brain for everything you've learned through repetition and rehearsal and discussions and so on. These are physical formations that are literally connected to everything you know or remember. If you were to suffer a stroke, your thinking would be impaired and you would try to rebuild those connections before you would have to rebuild those connections before you would be fluent again. And most people never fully recover, but, but even if you could, that still proves you were dependent on that cerebral mesh in the first place. And even if you could remove your mind and place it into somebody else's body, it wouldn't be you anymore because your mind is not just data and you're not just the things you know or remember. The neural pathways in that other brain would literally change your mind, forcing you to think differently. The new arms and legs would have different skills and talents from your that your old body did. And that other endocrine system would, after, would alter your preferences and your emotions, making you someone else. You wouldn't even recognize yourself anymore because you wouldn't be you anymore. You would be that other body. So how did primitive people get the idea that there were these mysterious, invisible, supernatural forces that could move things around and even animate life? Well, put yourself in the mindset of our ancient ancestors several thousand years ago. How would they have seen the world if they didn't know what we do? We feel the breeze move against our bodies all the time. Early tribes of primitive people couldn't explain the changes in the clouds or the weather that they brought, but they knew that the wind could move things and even carry things off into the sky as if held aloft by invisible hands. No one knew what smoke was, but they knew that dust devils were literally, or they thought that dust devils were literally devils, and that that's where the legends of genies came from. Whirlwinds appear out of nowhere and throw your stuff around and then disappear in, evan in evanescence. And... That's how we still imagine spirits today, at least the devilish ones. And no one understood diseases either. 
but they figured out pretty quickly that rancid fumes or the breath of a sick person would make others sick too, because sneezing and coughing are how you spread disease. And they thought that when you sneeze, the good spirit leaves your body and an evil spirit might jump in to take its place. So that when you get sick and maybe die, well, that's, that's why they would say bless you when you sneeze. If you're sneezing or coughing, you might spread evil spirits to someone else. And notice that in the Bible, uh, God performs a golem spell where he fashions a man out of mud and breathes into it the breath of life to animate it, to make it come alive. Wherein Adam did not acquire a living soul, he became a living soul. And there are other versions of this trope in even older myths from Mesopotamia through the Orient, where some sort of magician makes clay figures come alive by breathing the breath of life into them. There's, there are also other references to the breath of life where the movement of air is akin to a spiritual essence. A traditional Jewish belief is that when newborns take their first breath, they are infused with the spirit and become a living being. So air equals spirit. Since no one yet understood that air was made of particulate matter, but everyone knew that you would die if you can't breathe, and they knew that when people or animals die, they stop breathing, then it was believed that the movement of the air was somehow spiritual, and that when the spirit went inside you to, to, to give you life. So when Genesis 2, oh, 1 2 says that only the spirit of God moved on the face of the waters, it's, it's talking about the wind. And for another example, in Ezekiel 37, 5 through 10, there's a necromancer going into a boneyard to revive an army of the dead. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prof as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe unto these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. I should point out that the four winds were the Anamoy Greek gods, different from Jehovah and the Jehovah, who was a volcano god, essentially. So it's surprising that Jehovah would call upon the Greek gods to assist him here. Then in Genesis 6, we have the flood, which was meant to drown everything that had the breath of life, not realizing that whales breathe too. Remember that the Bible says that whales are fish. And I've known people in the 20th century who thought that whales were fish too, and they just they mistook their breath for water spouts. Then Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21, gives another example of how our notions of spirituality actually stem from a misunderstanding of the natural aspects of air. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath. And there is no, adma there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth. Notice again that if we had a soul then animals have one too, but we don't. It's just our breath and all the rest in vanity. This is according to the New American Standard Ver uh, Bible. The, the New Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, or the American Version, and the King James Version all replace the word breath with spirit. Likewise, if you compare Luke 2346 in the New American Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version with the King James or the American Standard Version, you'll see again that breathed his last means the same thing as gave up the ghost. 
in the story where Jesus commits his, his spirit to God or gives up the ghost, he breathes his last. In each case, they're making clear, the breath of life is spirit. This translation eloquently illustrates the gaseous origin of man's belief in his own soul. All of that is literally nothing but hot air.